Hello, good day, good morning, good whatever, students. Welcome back to Mr. Lahan's AP History Class Notes. Today, we're going to talk about Essential Question 2.6, and we're going to ask kind of two questions with this Essential Question, and these are what I want you to think about as we go through the notes. Number one is, what factors and motivations led Europeans to explore Africa and Asia in the 14 and 1500s? And the second thing we're going to talk about is what effects did this exploration have on Europe and indigenous people? So what we're going to talk about today, obviously, is the beginning of this, what European history calls Age of Discovery, where Columbus is going to sail across the Atlantic Ocean uh, and uh, and you know, Hernan Cortez and all of those people are going to go into Mexico. But Europeans are going to, quote unquote, discover America. And we're going to talk about why they are exploring in the first place and what effects this have uh, on Europeans and the people that they come in contact with. So pause if you need to, and let's get into these notes. Maybe. Why do I always do that? I don't even know. Okay, the age of discovery, in parentheses, the age of conquest, okay? So one of the most untalked about empires normally in history is the Portuguese Empire, all right? Now, like I said, uh, most of you guys have probably never even heard of the Portuguese Empire, but you've maybe you have heard of Portugal. But if you didn't know, the Portuguese Empire was the first major empire of Europe. And what do we mean by empire? A place that goes and conquers other places, all right? And you, uh, you conquer these places, uh, you take control of these places, you take the resource of these places, uh, you control the people of these places. You have an empire, all right? So, you might be like, uh, where is Portugal? Well, guys, if you look at a map, and I don't know where my map is, but if you look at a map, guys, uh, Portugal is literally on the west coast of the newly created United Spain, all right? So Spain and Portugal are literally right up next to each other. Portugal is this long, skinny country uh, right to the west of Spain. And one of the things that's going to happen is, if you remember, this is called the Iberian Peninsula. And Muslims had controlled the Iberian Peninsula for a very long time, but when Castile and Aragon united into Spain, the Muslims um, were expelled from this new kingdom. The Inquisition hunted down Muslims and conversos, Jews that converted to Christianity but weren't really practicing Christianity. But anyway, bottom line is, uh, now that uh, Europeans have retaken control of this area, they are going to start exploring. Now, why are they going to start exploring? Number one, they're motivated by gold, okay? You see, guys, in the 1200s, this guy named Marco... Polo? Did you guys say polo outside uh, or in your head? Maybe. I don't know. It's a game that we play in a uh, swimming pool, right? Uh, but anyway, Marco Polo in the 1200s was this explorer, and he took an overland route from Europe into Asia, and it took him 24 years to go to Asia and back. And when he came back, guys, Marco Polo had all of these tales of gold and spices and resources that were available in Asia. Well, ever since Marco Polo did this journey, Europeans have been trying to find a fast route to get back there. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to find gold. They're trying to find spice trade. And you're going to see later on, they're going to be also motivated by slaves. Now, another thing that they're going to try to find is a way around the Italian and Ottoman Empire dominated spice trade. Now, you might be like, what's the Ottoman Empire? Well, basically, it controls the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe, and it controls the spice trade going in and out of Asia. And like I said, most trade goes through Italy from the Mediterranean Sea. So bottom line is Europeans are trying to find like Spain, France, England, people like that, are trying to find ways to get around going through Italy and the Ottoman Empire to get their spices because that costs a lot of money. All right. So um, what happens is one of the, let me just come here. Okay. Look, here's what happens. So Europeans, all right, you see Europe at the top are trying to find a way to get to Asia, right? 
um, a quick route to get to Asia. Now, Italians control the Mediterranean Sea, so does the Ottoman Empire, all right? But Europeans think there is a faster way, and what they do is they go around the coast of Africa trying to find a way to cut through Africa. All right. Now, they don't know that Africa is this huge continent because they've never mapped it out yet. So what they do is they go around the coast until you get Bartholomew Diaz, this guy, and he's the one that finally says, hey, there's no way through Africa, but I have found a way to get around the southern tip of Africa. So he was the first guy to round the Cape of Good Hope and then from there go into Asia. All right. Now, he's Portuguese right? Another guy, Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama uh, was the first person to really establish trade in India in 1497. Okay, so where did my map go? Anyway, he went all the way around, uh, all the way around the coast of Africa. So let's go back to these pictures here. He went all the way around the coast of Africa and into Asia. All right. Now, by 1571, the Portuguese empire stretched all the way to Nagasaki, Japan. All right. So I want to I want to show you guys a map here. It starts in 1450. That's when they start exploring, guys. They explore the coast of Africa. And what they end up doing, guys, is by about 120 years later, the Portuguese Empire stretches all the way into Japan. All right. Now, one of the things I want to mention as they start to explore Africa, they're going to come into contact with African kingdoms like Ghana and the Kingdom of the Congo. And one of the things that Europeans are going to find when they go to these African kingdoms is a slave trade, okay? There is this huge slave trade that exists in Africa, and they are traded between Muslim kingdoms, and they're traded in the Middle East, and they're traded between African kingdoms, and this slave trade exists. So when Europeans roll up to Africa, they're going to say, ooh, we want slaves too, and they're going to start trading European goods for African slaves. Now, you're going to see this slave trade expand into what's called the transatlantic slave trade. And we're going to talk about that throughout other chapters. But you need to know this is where it begins. As Europeans pull up to these African kingdoms, these, these um, African kings and queens are going to want to trade slaves for European goods. If you want to learn more about that, jump into my African American history class next year. There's a little plug for that class. But anyway, so bottom line is the Portuguese were the first people to really get into Asia, and they had to go all the way around the coast of Africa to do it. And once they do it, they are going to establish not only trade with Asia, but they're also going to establish trade with a whole bunch of African kingdoms. All right. So. All right. Uh, pause if you need to. I want to show you this map. All right, so everything in the red, all the little red dots are controlled by the Portuguese. All right, so there's Portugal right up here. All right, go back. Portugal's right up here, guys. This is Spain, and the Portuguese literally explored the coast of Africa and got all the way into Asia. Now, you're going to see later on in a second, Columbus is going to go all the way to Haiti. All right. Uh, and then the Portuguese are there going to conquer basically what we know as Brazil. But the Portuguese guys have this vast empire of which they are going to collect natural resources from gold, slaves, and spices. Pause if you need to. Okay. Now let's talk about the big one that everybody knows about. Christopher Columbus, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, let's talk about Christopher Columbus. So here's the deal. Columbus, guys, has this idea that going around the coast of Africa takes way too long. He believes that he can sail west from Spain. Let me go back to this map. He believes, guys, he can sail west from Spain and go all, or, and go all the way around the world and land in Asia. All right? That's the idea. Now, here's the problem. Nobody in Europe knows the Americas exist. Now, We'll talk about later on, did other people know about, uh, you know, throughout history, did other people know about the Americans? Well, certainly the Vikings were in parts of North America, but Europeans at this time don't know the Americas exist. So literally, Columbus thinks he's going to sail all the way around the world and land in Asia. OK, uh, now here's the thing. There's a lot of myths going around about Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus did not prove the earth was round. Most scholars uh, in Europe believe that the earth was round. The whole idea of flat earth, that's like an old Viking idea that goes way back, you know, to medieval Europe, way back in the day. No scholar in the 1400s believed the world is round. Now, what they do believe is that the ocean is so big that no voyage can make it all the way to Asia. Christopher Columbus says, hold my wine, and he's, you know, instead of hold my beer. 
beer. You know, that's a classic meme. But anyway, that's actually a dead meme that nobody uses anymore. But anyway, guys, Christopher Columbus says, hold my wine, give me supplies, and give me uh, three ships, and I'll do it. So, guys, Columbus goes for funding to Ferdinand and Isabella, the new king and queen of a united Spain, and they agree to fund Columbus, all right? Now, Columbus sets off. Two months into the voyage, guys, they haven't found land, and literally, his crew is going to mutiny. They threaten him. They say, if we don't find land tomorrow, we're going to kill you, and we're going to go back to Europe. Well, luckily for Christopher Columbus, that is the day that they spot land, uh, and they land in Haiti right here, guys, all right? You see where it says, you are here? That's where they land. Now, because Columbus had no idea of the existence of North America, Central America, South America, he believed that he'd landed in the Indies, in Asia, in India. That's where he thought he'd landed. Uh, so anyway, guys, big mistake. He got way off course. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, obviously they didn't know about uh, North America, Central America, South America. So he believed, guys, that he'd landed there. And uh, let's talk about the consequences of Columbus now that he's here. Now, we're going to read, guys, um, a couple things. We're going to read in class. When you get back to class, we're going to read one of Columbus's letters to King Ferdinand describing his first interactions with what we would call Native Americans. And we're going to talk about in class, guys, what these perceptions of Native Americans are and what conclusions we can draw. But let's just talk about the consequences in general. Well, guys, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be this new link between what's called the New World, all right, the Americas, and the Old World, Europe, okay? Now, once again, I want to stress, Europeans did not discover America, all right? Uh, Native Americans, guys, has, have lived on the continent of North America for about 10,000 years since the last ice age, okay? When when Nat when um, Siberians, people from what we would call Asia and maybe Russia, uh, Native Americans crossed this land bridge on the Bering Strait and started to migrate in North America 10,000 years before, all right? So when Columbus rolls up, he doesn't roll up to empty land that nobody lives on. He rolls up to land that people live on, all right? So I always throw that out there because, you know, we throw around the word discover, but it's hard to discover something with people already living on it. It would be like if I rolled up into your house when you weren't there and discovered your PlayStation 5 and said, wow, I claim this PlayStation 5 in the name of Mr. Lahan. Would I do that? I don't know. I don't even have PlayStation. Anyway, guys, it doesn't matter. All right, so anyway, guys, discovery is a, you know, it's, it's a word. In the European minds, it was discovered, okay? All right, now, another thing that's going to happen is other European nations are going to conquer North America, okay? So the Spanish are going to come in. The Portuguese are going to come in. They're going to conquer and create colonies, all right. Pretty soon the French are going to come in. Then the British are going to come in. Well, the French, the Dutch, then the British are going to come in. And that's where you're going to get, guys, the 13 colonies that will eventually lead to the creation of the United States. So other European nations are going to come in. So, but bottom line is you get this trade going back and forth, and we call it the Columbian Exchange. What's the Columbian Exchange, guys? It's just a term that historians use to describe the transfer of plants, animals, resources, and disease from one continent to the next, right? When Europeans come to the Americas, they're going to have things that Native Americans have never seen, like horses, okay? Horses are not indigenous to uh, the Americas, okay? So Europeans are going to see these horses and they've never seen them before. They're going to bring weapons like guns and steel, okay? Native Americans, guys, don't have guns. They don't have steel. They do have different kinds of weapons and tools and things like that, okay? They're going to bring different food that Native Americans have never seen. And likewise, guys, Europeans are going to take from the Americas food and resources that don't exist in Europe. So that's the Columbian Exchange. Now, one of the things that Europeans are going to bring, which are pretty deadly, is diseases like smallpox. Okay? When Europeans come over here, Native Americans having no contact with Europeans, therefore having no immunity to European diseases, are going to get decimated. Their populations are going to get decimated by this incoming European disease. Okay? So, what's going to happen as a consequence is this. Native population in the Americas is going to drop dramatically. Why? Well, warfare between Europeans and disease brought by Europeans. And on the other hand, European population, which was on the decline because of famines and the bubonic plague, 
They're going to start rising. Why? Because European diets are about to get a whole lot better because they're going to be introduced to new foods that they've never been introduced to, like corn, beans, squash, potatoes. All of these things, guys, are going to become staples of European diets. So you're going to see, in general, native population is going to decline, but European population is going to increase. Pause if you need to. Okay, let's talk about the Spanish Empire and the New World, all right? So, when Europeans come over, all right, they have interactions with the natives. Now, we'll talk a little bit about um, Christopher Columbus, like I said, in his letter to King Ferdinand. But basically, Spaniards after Columbus are going to come over, and they are going to explore, um, they're going to explore America. One of the things they're looking for, once again, is a pathway, is a passageway to the Indies, because they still don't quite understand uh, that they are not, in fact, Asia. And they're going to find out pretty quick. But they are also going to be looking for gold. All right, golden resources. So Hernan Cortez is one of these uh, one of these Spanish explorers. They're called conquistadores, conquerors. And when they go into Mexico, guys, they are going to find the Aztec civilization. Now, I always like to talk about this in my world history class. What were the Aztecs like before Europeans arrived? Guys, Aztecs had this amazing, powerful uh educated, intellectual civilization, all right? They had these huge pyramids. They had complex math, complex calendars. They had um, interesting ways of growing food, guys. They had these canals. They had what we would call a modern city. You see, Europeans, when and, and we know this from Columbus's journals, when Europeans go into the city of Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City, and they go to the Aztec capital, they see things that are just wo a wonder to their eyes, all right? Europeans live in like huts, one-room huts, guys, but Aztecs lived in almost like apartment complexes stacked on top of each other. These guys have immense power, immense wealth, and immense capabilities. You know what they don't have? Immunity to European diseases and European weapons. So, um, excuse me. Uh, and another thing that Aztecs do, guys, is they themselves are conquerors, all right? They are known for conquering rival tribes and surrounding tribes uh, that are in the area and basically offering these uh, people as human sacrifices to their gods and enslaving the populations of these people around them. So, why I tell you that is to kind of give you this little story about Hernan Cortez. So Cortez rolls up into Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, right? And the ruler is Montezuma II. Now, there is a god in Aztec culture called Quetzalcoatl. And Quetzalcoatl in uh, Aztec religion went away and one day promised to come back. Okay, and the Quetzalcoatl is like the serpent god that takes on a lot of different forms. But anyway... That is the story. Quetzalcoatl went away and one day claimed he would come back. Well, Aztecs had never seen white people before. They'd never seen horses before and people in armor mounted on horses. So when Cortez and his men roll up to the capital, Montezuma II and his priests just assume that this guy's Quetzalcoatl, the returning god. Now, Cortez, not going to really dispute that, goes in and they start to engage with the Aztecs. All right. They start to engage. At first, relations aren't you know, that bad. But very quickly, Hernan Cortez and his men's desire for gold, which Aztecs wear in their ears and in their noses and on their bodies, kind of show Montezuma II and uh, his priests that these guys aren't gods. They're just another group of people they've never met before. So Montezuma tricks Cortez into going out into the wilderness looking for gold and leaving like half his men in the city. And while Cortez goes out looking for gold, Montezuma II uh, sacrificed Cortez and his men. Now, Cortez realizing that he'd been duped, goes back to the city, but it's too late. Uh, he can hear, as him and his men camp outside of the city, they can hear uh, their friends and cohorts and their fellow soldiers getting sacrificed to the gods. So what does Cortez do? He goes around to all the rival tribes that are enemies of the Aztecs. Why? Because remember, the Aztecs themselves are conquerors going around and conquering people for human sacrifice. And he gets an alliance of Native American groups and they unite and they go and basically conquer the Aztec capital. All right. So Hernan Cortez comes in, guys. And by 1521, Montezuma II is defeated and the Aztec capital is conquered in the name of Spain. 
Now, Francisco Pizarro is going to do pretty much the same thing, all right, long story short, uh, in Peru. He defeated their leader, Atahualpa, in 1533, okay? Now, bottom line is, guys, I, I go into the the um, the um the story of Cortez because pretty much this pattern is repeated. Pizarro, Cortez, all of these guys and other conquistadores go through Central America, South America, parts of North America, and they conquer. All right. At first, there might be some kind of, you know, trade engaged in with Europeans and Native Americans, but very quickly it develops into warfare. And what warfare doesn't kill guys, disease sweeps away the rest of the population. So the conquest of Mexico and South America, large numbers of natives, guys, are going to be defeated by small armed European armies and diseases, okay? And this is one of the consequences of Columbus rolling up into North America, okay? Europeans are going to discover and they're going to come and they're going to conquer these people, all right? Pause if you need to. Okay, last uh, couple things here. Now, when the Spanish set up, guys, their empire, their whole idea is to control the resources, guys, but also because they're Catholic, right? Their whole idea is to convert Native Americans to Christianity. So what do they do? They set up missions everywhere. Like you guys have seen missions up in... Um, Ventura. Maybe you've been to Ventura, or maybe you've gone down to San Juan Capistrano, but missions, right? Now, a mission, guys, is kind of like the headquarters of Spanish control, all right? It's the church. It's where the armies hang out, guys. They have um, they have plantations where they grow crops, but the whole idea is, guys, to establish Spanish power in an area, okay? Now, in order to grow crops and support everybody, the very first slaves that were used in this country, guys, were Native Americans, all right. They used Native Americans as forced labor at first. You see, guys, they had this system called the encomienda. Now, what the encomienda, guys, was, was a labor contract of the right for landowners, guys, and the church and people that are in control of an area claimed by Spain to have a specific number of Native American slaves under their control. All right. Now, the slaves were, produ were to produce crops uh, and things like that, but also you were responsible for feeding these Native American slaves uh, and teaching them Christianity. All right. Now, as you can imagine, guys, things go pretty bad pretty quick, right? So um, another thing that uh, Native American slaves might do is mining gold and silver. And once again, we're going to read, guys, what lives were like and the conditions were like for these Native American slaves. And we're going to see, guys, that it was pretty, uh, you know, Hell on earth, I guess, is the best way you can describe it. So eventually, the Spanish developed large agricultural plantations. All right, now a plantation, guys, is a big plot of land where you have lots of slaves and you grow a cash crop. Cash crops are crops that you grow in order to sell to make money. All right. So eventually, guys, uh, wealthy Europeans came in and controlled their own land, wealthy um, Spanish landowners, and this land was called the Hacienda, and they would have their own Native American slaves, all right? And they would be growing stuff on these huge plantations. Now, here's the deal. All right, we're going to talk about slavery a lot in this class, especially throughout the next, um, the next several chapters, all right? Uh, slavery in Native American starts or excuse me, slave, slavery in the Americas starts with the Spanish and the Portuguese enslaving Native Americans. Now, it's very quickly, after a while, going to turn into African slavery. But it starts off with Native American slavery. Now, let's talk about conditions that Native Americans experienced under slavery. And the reason we know about some of them is this guy named Bartolome de las Casas. Now, Bartolome de las Casas was a Spanish priest that lived in the Americas, and he lived on these missions where Native Americans were enslaved. And at first, guys, he was for the Spanish conquest, right? But after a while, uh, de las Casas begins to see the hardship and the um, the horrible things happening to Native Americans under Spanish rule. And he goes back to Spain and he's going to write this work called The Devastation of the Indies. And in this work, he's going to argue that Spanish people, royalty, should stop enslaving Native Americans because you're going to read, we're going to read this in class, guys, because he's going to say that they are murdering, they are raping, they are doing all manner of things, guys, killing Native Americans. And what they don't do with murder, disease is wiping out. So he's going to argue, guys, that this is bad and the Spanish need to stop enslaving Native Americans. All right. Now, he's also going to argue 
that African people would make better slaves because they are more immune to European diseases. Now, I do have to tell you, later on, De Las Casas is going to feel bad for recommending Africans be used as slaves because he's going to see the same horrible things that happen to Native Americans are going to also happen to Africans. So, eventually, De Las Casas is going to be a critic of slavery in general. But what you see, guys, from De Las Casas and the information that we're going to read in class is the horrible treatment, and we're going to see what slavery was like in the Americas under Spanish control. Pause if you need to. All right. So, what are the effects of society of discovering Europe, or discovering the Americas? Well, guys, look. Europeans didn't even know the Americas exist, all right? They thought their world centered around Europe and Asia and parts of Africa. They never knew, guys, that this new continent exists. So a lot of these old European ideas are going to be challenged. A lot of these long-standing ideas are going to be challenged. And guys, this is a time where Europeans are challenging those ideas anyway. Look at the humanists in the Renaissance challenging the ideas of the Roman Catholic Church, right? Uh, Europe is about to be flooded with gold and silver from the Americas, which is going to inflate the European economy. Now, inflation is when you have too much money in circulation, and what that does is it brings down the value of that money. All right. So the economy in Europe is going to kind of crash a little bit. Why? Because there's so much gold, it brings down the value of gold. Money doesn't go as far as it used to, and the prices of goods go up. So that's going to cause some serious problems, guys, in, the Amer in, uh, in Europe. And another thing that's going to emerge, guys, is commercialism and capitalism. This idea that people get like, hey, if I have enough money, I can send a ship to the Americas. I can get some slaves. I can get a piece of land. I can grow cash crops and have that money sent back to me, and I can become wealthy. Capitalism, the idea of owning capital, which is the means to um, the means to you know, have a business, right? I own a ship. Uh, I own slaves. I own uh, land. I can turn these resources into money. All right. And capitalism, guys, is going to grow and become a major influence throughout the rest of European history. Uh, but it kind of really starts to grow in this period, the idea of making money uh, and and making profit. Okay. Well, anyway, guys, that's the end of class. Also, or excuse me, that's the end of the notes, guys. I will see you in class.